Um, in his day job, he's the executive director of KESEP. Um, and John is acknowledged as one of Australia's foremost authorities in the area of waste management and litter reduction strategies. Um, John will probably talk a little bit more about KSAP, um, but uh, perhaps su suffice to just give a little bit of background to that uh, uh, KSAP, which originally, I guess, stands for Keep South Australia Beautiful, started its life um, some just about 50 years ago as a litter reduction campaign with uh, support from the Adelaide Junior Chamber of Commerce, the Advertiser Newspapers, um, what was then the Australian Glass manufacturer, Manufacturers, now Owen, Illinois, and uh, Glass, and RAA and General Motors Holden. So, um, and since that time, much of KSAP's work has been groundbreaking and um, is actually studied and emulated around the world. So, it, um, and, and this organization, through the stewardship of, of John, really um, punches well above its weight. And, um, and indeed, uh, programs such as wipe out waste, litter less in schools, natural resource management education, um, clean sites for um, uh, building construction where it's, you know, it's, it's, it's seen as best practice now, but for Australia, these are some of the, the range of programs. However, John has many other strings to his bow and uh, other than leading KSAP, and has worked in, um, in, in the field in, in, and in allied areas in remote indigenous communities and in countries as diverse as India, Indonesia, and most recently, Mongolia. Rotarians, guests, and friends, please welcome our guest speaker today, John Phillips. Uh, thank you, Zinghai, for that introduction, and uh, thank you to Adelaide Rotary for the invitation to talk with you today. Uh, Really what we're talking about today is an expose of KSAB, 50 years old, uh, when you and I, in the main, uh, we didn't have litter bins um, to dispose of our litter. We used 44-gallon drums. Um, we had a horse and cart or a tractor and trailer collecting our rubbish from the gutter uh, because in many places we didn't have gutters. We just had the dirt roads. So 50 years, we've come a long way. Uh, as to where we've been, and every single person in this room has been involved. So I just thought I'd give you a little bit of a background of KSAB, uh, where we've come from, where we are today, um, and certainly uh, the respect that the organisation has gathered uh, in a global context. So quickly, uh, our mission is to inspire, influence and advocate for environmental sustainability. And I think it's fair to say that sustainability wasn't a word that was used uh, only um, recently in the last decade where we started to realise that we need to plan for the future. And how we deliver is through partnerships and programs that engage communities and we want to see real outcomes. So a quick wheel of capacity building. Um, we are a new age uh, leadership organisation. We focus uh, on issues today and what might be issues tomorrow. We can't change what's happened necessarily in the past. We have to deal with language. We have to deal with changing communication, Facebook, Twitter, all the sorts of things that uh, make it more difficult for us to engage with community. A change in consumerism, you're all aware of the huge and vast array of consumer products that are available to you and the packaging that they come in. Um, and I suppose we've also uh, certainly looked at um, from litter or rubbish, first of all to waste and then recycling and now how we view that product as a resource. South Australia has uh, probably the strongest uh, waste measures, policy, strategic direction in Australia uh, and is undergoing significant waste reform. For instance, just in a small state, uh, 1.6 million people, uh, we create um, nearly 
five and a half, six million tonne of waste a year that is made up of commercial and industry, industry, municipal solid waste, construction and demolition, and of course the individual waste generation that you and I might make. This state is able to uh, demonstrate a diversion, that is uh, waste that is not going to landfill, of nearly four million tonnes in 15-16. That's an 81% recycling rate and that is a market value of over $200 million, which is where the circular economy comes in. How can we capture that waste, change it to a resource and then put it back to good use? We, we still have not that far off a million tonnes of waste that we need to divert and that's the, uh, the high hanging fruit, not the low hanging fruit. So there's lots of areas that we need to address and this state through its waste reform process uh, has also introduced a waste levy. So when you pay your council rates every time um, your waste is picked up you pay both uh, a council rate for your weekly or fortnightly pickup but you also contribute to quite handsomely to the state government to around about $100 a tonne for waste that goes across the Weybridge to our landfill and disposal points. So the sorts of things that we do um, from a KESAB perspective, working with our partners, um, very much about education, engagement and change of behaviour. So people can be engaged and take some action to solve the problem at the local level. The circular economy, the, the, uh, the, I suppose the emphasis is um, picking up your waste, identifying what's in the bin, what can be separated and what can be reprocessed. It's made into new products and it comes back to you uh, as household consumer items. Uh, and the three areas, waste to landfill is uh, in most instances your small bin. Uh, most metropolitan councils have a three bin system, a recycling bin, um, that would be a yellow top in most instances, but we do have some very proud councils out there that like to have their own version and colours. Uh, and then we have um, an organics bin which can take anything that is organic, uh, garden clippings, food, all sorts of things, obviously no plastics and the like. So we really do have a leadership, um, a leading role in South Australia, demonstrating to the rest of Australia and the world on how we can do these things. South Australia led the way 40 years ago with container deposit legislation. So you're all aware that you consume a beverage, you can take that empty container back to a recycling depot um, and get your 10 cents back. Uh, and that is, again, a huge incentive with somewhere around about 85 to 90 per cent of beverage containers returned for recycling and um, reconstitution into new product or exported uh, overseas. We're still, or until last year, the year before, were the only state to have container deposit legislation and the big states, New South Wales, Queensland, Victoria, are yet to adopt. Uh, and we think uh, when that's introduced next month in New South Wales we'll see some significant changes again in how people manage their waste. And then we also work with local government and community engagement programs through Re Recycle Right. That is so that you get the information correct. What can you recycle? What bin does it go in? How can we improve our individual performance uh, which ultimately saves your council's money uh, when it comes to waste levy? Um, the waste industry in South Australia is a $1 billion industry. It's not insignificant, it employs around about 5,000 people. And there is quite sophisticated machinery that sits behind the collection and the separation of our waste uh, into either recyclables, reusables, recoverables. Uh, and that, again, is supported by a whole lot of programs that you as householders and individuals might not see. We have a waste audit team at KESAB that physically, even today at 35 degrees, are sticking their head in your bin somewhere in Adelaide to ascertain what's in the bin. Uh, can there be improvement with separation? Um, can we uh, make some 
specific uh, effort when it comes to engaging community, especially non-English speaking, uh, who need to embrace some of the cultures of our waste separation. But we have had huge success with a 40% um, presentation of food improvement. There's a very strong food on waste. Look at your table today. Uh, is there wastage? I'm sure there is. In Australia alone, uh, an estimated $80 million worth of food is wasted. Maybe it's portion size, maybe it's um, other aspects, maybe it's put into the wrong bin. So there's area that we can turn food, food into resources, compost, uh, biofuel and the like. So 40% of household waste is organic. Fruit and vegetables, your processed foods, your tea bags, coffee grounds, you know, a lot of households got little coffee machines these days. Um, paper towels and tissue, tissues can all go into the compost, the green organics bin, for reprocessing into um, soil products through the peat soil and the Jefferies soils organisations. Xinghai mentioned uh, the Little Less program. We've recently exported that overseas um, as a model of how students uh, and teachers through professional development can take up um, community engagement, change the behaviour at a very young age. We're certainly focusing on preschools at the moment. Um, how we can um, address consumer and litter items and especially um, the focus at the moment is plastics. Uh, it's not about plastics being bad, they offer a lot of advantages. But at the moment uh, there is about 8 million tonne of plastic floating around our oceans globally. And I'll show you uh, several photos, uh, images a little later. 8 million tonne of plastic floating around uh, our oceans, which originally is all land-based. And we need to be able to protect not only our oceans but our fish species because as that plastic break down fish species eat that you eat fish you are ingesting some of that plastic so the microplastics that are evolving uh, are of concern globally and uh, we've got a very strong focus working with uh, a couple of areas overseas and the CSIRO to try and reduce that impact Believe it or not, we run community tours to landfill sites. A lot of people want to know what happens to their rubbish. Uh, my mother, when she was alive, the, the dear old soul, it was not convinced because we had uh, recycling and uh, uh, putrescible waste or residual waste being picked up at the front gate uh, that just because it went into the truck, it was being recycled. Um, I can assure you it is, but we engage with community um, and through all sorts of mediums um, because the ability for KeySav at the moment, it's not about uh, TV or radio. Uh, we don't, do not have the funds to advertise. The government doesn't demonstrate that it has the, the, uh, the funds either, although it sets the policy. Uh, but there's also that change of social media. So what's our accessibility and who is our demograph to reach? It's not just the young ones when it comes to litter and, and illegal disposal. It's also about some of the, the older people that are not convinced that what we're doing uh, is really working. We also have uh, a number of um, um, interactive Opportunities, Wally the Wipeout Waste Wizard who gets into schools and conducts his magic tricks uh, and it's just unbelievable how kids respond to that. We have awards programs because if you ask the community to become involved, of course it's about how you can recognise their effort. So the old Tidy Towns program which is now Sustainable Communities, our Wipeout Waste program, Nude Food Days which identify that um, uh, you don't have to package or repackage uh, food. A banana has a skin on it. Um, so why would you then put it in a plastic bag? And with our school audits, uh, it's not unusual for us to find fully packaged lunches that mums and dads uh, have prepared for their students to be disposed of in the school 
litter bin because uh, those students somehow have chosen that they might want to go down the road uh, for a Macca's or a Hungry Jack's during the, the lunch break. Uh, that's, that's fine, but I suppose what that allows us also to do is to bring in uh, other aspects of um, appropriate waste disposal, but also consumption in healthy foods, uh, and hence nude food, uh, and that really gets the kids involved. And one of the other areas that we work on is uh, with the um, Attorney General's Department on graffiti. Graffiti is a crime. Uh, it impacts on individuals, it impacts on public infrastructure, and more importantly, the association with graffiti is also um, a graffiti-free community is a safe community. The perception, rightly or wrongly, that if you've got a lot of graffiti uh, and a lot of um, litter and a lot of uh, illegal dumping is that that is not a safe community and that impacts on that community. Um, people do not go out and, and assist council to do the right thing and value add like a Rotary Club would. They, they say, well, let's keep out of that area, it's not safe, we don't want to be there, we want to, we want to work where it's clean and green. And so we've worked very closely with the likes of um, Dipti, with the new railway and uh, tram corridors, which are always uh, open to uh, public um, reaction with the amount of waste that ultimately ends up off trains, along the fence lines, uh, railway stations that might not have litter bins or recycling bins or the like, and of course vandalism that comes with that sometimes. Uh, and as Steve Larkin will be full aware, uh, fully aware, we run the Clean Site Program, which is about changing behaviour on, on building sites. There's a lot of recyclables and recoverables from a building site, but there's a lot of waste and litter that impacts on, on the communities uh, and areas which maybe over years have been pristinely clean, and all of a sudden a building site goes up and builders do not contain their waste properly, and residents are very, very concerned about that, especially in new building developments. They might be the first house being uh, occupied in a new development. Another 30 houses have to be built, but they're copying the waste and the illegal dumping that comes with uh, a new development when people um, just simply drop their mattresses, drop their old televisions off in a building site at the cost of the building contractor. So there, there's a real cost implication uh, as well. So we undertake the clean site program. We have the road watch program, simply that's about transport drivers, uncovered loads, illegal dumping, working with Dipti we have 125, 130 voluntary groups owning four kilometres of road and they clean that section of road up uh, four times a year. And it was interesting to note the uh, comment um, about your work uh, and uh, planting of trees because it's also an opportunity for those volunteer groups to protect native vegetation which are usually stands along uh, some of our main highways and byways. And we're very strong on professional development. We do prepare models for teachers, a package for teachers so that when they go into the classroom They've got curriculum-based product um, that is very focused on how they can engage their students um, and have some consistent message. It is very much about consistency with the change of language that we have uh, in today's waste reform world. And we also have a very strong relationship with our remote Aboriginal communities. Um, English is the second language in almost all of our Aboriginal communities and working on the APY lands uh, is always a challenge uh, but nevertheless there are 11 schools up there and, and we would argue that they're part of the South Australian fabric. We need to engage uh, and ensure that there's some consistency in delivery. But the two issues that we face on there, uh, face there and, and you'll see a couple of images in a minute, um, of course is waste management the expectation that we should have resource recovery, and secondly, water. Traditionally, the remote communities have pulled their water from rock holes, 
Now um, most of the water is delivered through a bore system and SA Water have a, 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 a very strong network of pipes and filtration on the lands but the water table is dropping uh, and that means that uh, we need to change uh, usage and understanding of water in the APY lands uh, and of course um, understand that the conservation is very much part of the requirement um, on those lands for the 3,000, 3,500 uh, residents. We also work with 130 recycling depots and recycling depots are not just about container deposits. They take your metal, they take your batteries, they take plastics, uh, they may well take e-waste in the future uh, and they will take other products down the track. So it's very much that we engage so that there's some consistency between local government working with the community, working with schools and working with those recycling depots to achieve significant um, waste diversion outcomes. And cigarette butts were mentioned. Cigarette butts are 40% of the total litter stream that we count throughout Australia. Um, and that's simply a behavioural issue. And I'd make no apologies to smokers. Um, there are plenty of opportunities for butts to be disposed of properly. They end up in our waterways, they end up in our oceans, and it's another level of pollution. And then we have the iconic Baz of the Bunyip that will return to the Murray River this year, um, currently at Morgan, and that's about not only litter and waste in the river, but it's also about safety in the river, how people use the river recreationally these days with jet skis and holiday houses and the like. So there is a behavioural requirement to understand how we protect that river environment. And just uh, in winding up, um, because I'm sure there'll be a few questions, um, some of the challenges. So remote Aboriginal communities. Um, in the APY lands, um, because of remoteness, sometimes tucked away in the corner of um, the, the northwestern corner, um, every community has uh, a car yard. And at last estimate, when I was up there only several weeks ago, probably about 3,000 cars or, or corpses uh, on the lands it's a resource, um, it's a blight on the community, and we are working with government to try and implement a clean-up program. Of course, that costs money. But the government does have a waste levy. It has $80 million of waste levy sitting in the bank somewhere. We would say they need to reinvest some of that in some of these communities. Uh, and their waste disposal is still uh, very archaic, a trench uh, in, the, in the soil and uh, every day they'll set fire to that um, and just burn it away. Now included in that, uh, a very small population of three and a half thousand consume in the vicinity of a one million, dollars, uh, one million units of beverage, Coca-Cola. It's a dry community, no alcohol. So we're talking Coca-Cola and the like, one million units. Nearly all of that ends up in the trench and is buried. 10 cents a pop. Um, that's money back to the community. <laughs> but recently uh, we undertook a, um, a marine debris uh, project in Lombok uh, following uh, an invitation by an Australian tour guide, uh, very concerned at the amount of plastic that is entering the environment. Um, so we visited Lombok uh, through a small donation that we received. Uh, worked with the tour operators uh, on that island, which uh, sells itself as an eco-island. It brings people into the island on an enviro tour visit. Um, I think nothing could be worse than on arrival to see the amount of plastic uh, that is just uh, littered in the community, uh, along the highways and certainly on the beaches. And of course you can see the sophisticated waste collection uh, vehicle the sophisticated uh, waste um, collection vehicle that they're using. Um, we think there's a lot we can do and we met with a, a delegation of 20 uh, people from Indonesia uh, only last week in Adelaide to talk to uh, us and government about how we could uh, transport some of our programs over there.
And Xinhai mentioned also uh, Mongolia. Um, last, uh, this year, earlier this year, we undertook a program with uh, a Rotary Club uh, in Mongolia, in the capital, uh, who had received a small amount of funding from the Australian Government and we uh, implemented our Wipeout Waste Program to schools, universities, teacher training um, and we received tremendous support, uh, tremendous coverage. I suppose that the centre photo there is that the herds people in Mongolia actually let their herds feed um, on the landfill site and they make a meagre living collecting bottles and cans and plastic for recycling. Um, as we arrived uh, on that Saturday morning, that cow was actually consuming plastic. So the very wealth that they have in their herd is surely being killed off because whilst the, the truck is dumping its rubbish on the landfill site, the herd is coming over and trying to get into the, the organic mat, matter to eat, uh, but ultimately ends up consuming plastic. So we've been invited back a second time through the Australian Embassy um, to Mongolia next year to uh, further our work there and certainly uh, one of the aspects is taking that waste off site, uh, cardboard and making heat bricks for, through a social enterprise program. Finally, we can't do it without partners and sponsors. We've got a huge array of partners and sponsors. There's probably no one in South Australia that we haven't worked with uh, and we continue to work with. We've got a good vision, uh, certainly with Indonesia uh, project and our Mongolia project, building on the success that we have in South Australia. But what I did notice um, was that Rotary wasn't there. Um, so I just thought I'd put that there as well. There might be an opportunity at some stage for us to have a, a discussion. KESAB is an iconic South Australian organisation uh, and can certainly value add uh, at the community level. Thank you. Thank you, John. Um, look, um, I think we'll just go straight into questions. I mean, this is obviously a, a very, very comprehensive overview of a very complex subject. Um, David? Um, that's, that's a really good and uh, relevant question. In answer to the program War on Waste, um, there will be, so you might just write this down, the fourth um, program for War on Waste is scheduled for Sunday, December the 3rd, um, only a few weeks ago, and um, whilst I haven't seen the program, I think that KESAB will be um, truly well represented. Uh, on that program and the way that we've gone about our business in South Australia. It also coincides with the introduction of container deposit systems in New South Wales, um, which is a huge change. So we've developed through the circular economy a market uh, based on our recoverables and recyclables and up until now have done very well. And the premise of that has been the success of container deposit legislation, glass, plastic, liquid paperboard, PET, plastic bottles and, and aluminium cans and the like. Um, New South Wales hasn't been able to do that as successfully uh, and in more recent times um, most of the product, if it's not consumed locally, uh, paper and cardboard at Visi, uh, ACI Glass or, or Owen Illinois in uh, Adelaide and Aurora at uh, Barossa take all the glass for remanufacture into wine bottles. We're very lucky in that context. Um, but having said that, some of the stuff has been exported and it's mainly been plastic. China is about to shut the door on uh, taking plastic on the premise that they're saying uh, we're not going to be the dumping ground anymore. Because they don't only take it from us, they take it from, from uh, Europe, they take it from uh, America. Uh, and we're talking significant tonnages. And they've got some obligations to reduce um, climate change emissions and the like. So the challenge is at the moment, how do we innovate and be smart 
so that we can use that at a local level. Uh, Nystar at Port Piri might be one of the answers in converting that waste into a, into a product. Um, right in the middle of that discussion at the moment. Sorry, can I get um, Steve? Uh, well, in many instances it is shredded um, or uh, it is uh, pelletised. But um, the big issue is the separation. You've got seven different polymers. So you've got HDP, PET, uh, vinyl, um, all sorts of things. So it's, um, you've got film plastic such as Glad Wrap as opposed to the, for instance, a beverage bottle. The cap is different than the label, is different to the polymer of the main bottle. So it's how you separate, because you cannot necessarily recycle and reconstitute mixed plastic. So technology innovation and maybe banning some products. Let me quickly mention the coffee cup. You know, we all consume coffee by the gallon these days. Every time we go out, we have a coffee. At the moment, whilst the cardboard coffee cup is recyclable, it, it, technically, it is not recycled. And that's a separation issue because it needs to be separated from other cardboards because it's got a plastic liner. So debt pack in Adelaide, we're currently trialling um, a recyclable coffee cup working with the Adelaide airport, which will soon go totally organic. Everything in the airport will be recyclable. Food waste, cutlery, everything. It might be three years, but they're working on it. Um, so when we get the right mix with the recyclable coffee cup, we can probably divert one billion coffee cups a year from landfill and recycle it. So technology, innovation, but also make sure that we've got the manufacturing to be able to achieve that. It's a bit of a scale of economy. We've just got uh, time for two more questions. Um, can we just get it over there? Adelaide University Rotaract Club and the student of international development and languages at Adelaide Uni. Um, the two are more linked than people realise. And my, my question was, when delivering development, can you hear me? Yep. Yeah, I can hear you, but I can't so, understand it. So, when delivering development in the APY lands, the Aboriginal communities, what emphasis is given on Aboriginal language reclamation or teaching Aboriginal people in their first language? And how do you conduct these lessons when talking about ways? So that's about Aboriginal home match. Sorry, I, I couldn't quite pick it up. With it in the language. Um, with difficulty. Um, we we uh, do have two key programs on Aboriginal lands, uh, APY lands, uh, and we work very closely with the schools the um, state education department with curriculum development and we sit within their curriculum framework. In most instances the programs that we offer are practical. So for instance a couple of weeks ago we were, um, went right through the lands and we took the students out to their uh, rock holes and we demonstrated uh, water quality, turbidity, 
oxygen, pH and the like. And physically they were involved in uh, using the turbidity tubes and, and the uh, uh, other equipment for short lessons, interpretive lessons, with, of course, the students uh, and the Aboriginal worker um, education assistants. Whilst uh, language, as you probably are aware, uh, English is second, secondary, most of the students are acutely aware of English and, and engage. Um, the biggest issue that we have is attention. The, the three issues on the APY lands are numeracy, literacy and attendance. You might have a school of 114 students and some days, due to cultural differences or issues or requirements, there might only be five or six or seven students uh, to engage. So um, it is with difficulty, but um, we are getting some tremendous results. Um, but from a language perspective, uh, very much we frame that around the local community working with people in that community um, so that we recognise uh, the issues at hand and can have that interface. I have two questions. One is regarding wine bottles. Why is there a 10 cent return on that? Uh, can I just say that would be the last question and that would have to be a very quick answer as we're running out of time. Uh, good question. When um, CDL, container deposit legislation, came into being, it was effectively to, um, in response to litter. You'll all remember that our milk bottles were refillable. We'd take our big heavy glass bottles back to the delicatessen so that they could be refillable. Around about the mid-70s, we had one trip containers, in other words, throwaway containers. Um, so we focused very much on consumer or what we call lunchtime trade. Uh, wine was not a lunchtime trade, it was a, a restaurant or home use, home consumption, which didn't end up uh, and still doesn't end up into the litter stream. We'll have to close that, I'm afraid. Um, it, is, it is gone on two o'clock. Um, thank you very much, John, for uh, an extremely thought pro provoking very, very comprehensive, but on the other hand, as you can see, we have barely scratched the surface of um, this topic that really concerns all of us in a very, very profound way. Um, thank you very much again, John, and um, it's, uh, it's in a rotary tradition that we um, give our guests a, a little memento of, uh, um, um, of our gratitude, and, um, and this is... Um, a very magnificent uh, pen. But, uh, you can then... Well, we can, uh, thank you.